Welcome, everybody. The topic today is medication and treatment decisions, navigating online information and misinformation, and evaluating the evidence. So most of you are familiar with the term evidence-based medicine, and that's a direction that we've really seen grow in the last 30 years. In fact, when I was a young faculty, I was instrumental at teaching the evidence-based medicine courses at UBC for the residency program and developing the curriculum. But what do you do when robust evidence doesn't exist? Because I'm not a cardiologist, I don't have the luxury of referring to trials that are repeated with 10,000 individuals in them. Sometimes I feel really privileged if there's 100 people. And often these studies or these papers are not at the same level of evidence that one would normally require for cardiology or stroke or other issues. Because one of the things I always write in my medical legal reports is that if I had to only make suggestions based on large randomized controlled trials that have been replicated, that have a meta-analysis and that have a practice guideline, I would basically have nothing to offer patients. So what do we do when robust evidence doesn't exist? Well, for a lot of people, it's the desperation action model. And that puts you at risk for a number of reasons. And so like the cat, hang in there and hopefully we'll get you away from this approach. So evidence-based medicine has evolved considerably since I first started to teach it. And now we look at not just what is the best evidence, but the clinician's judgment and the patient's values and preferences. What constitutes an acceptable risk or an acceptable cost varies significantly from one patient to another. And some patients are not interested in medications at all, which is totally legitimate. And that's why I often ask patients is, do you prefer a non-pharmacologic approach? Because I'm not here to push medications or any treatment. I'm here to help you make decisions. And so what we're really talking about is shared decision-making between me, you, your values, your preferences, and the best available evidence. So navigating online is really tricky. It's sometimes hard to differentiate fact versus fiction, especially since we live in a post-truth and post-science era. There's a lot of people out there who don't try. And we now have the concept of alternative facts. And so we have to be especially careful about what we read on the internet. There's one patient that I saw and was actually his mother who drove the interview. But within the first 10 minutes, she basically told me that I don't trust doctors and I don't believe in science. And what am I supposed to do with that, right? It's her, it's her choice. But for her, referring to blogs and getting people's opinions was a better way of evaluating treatment than reading literature or taking advice from a clinician. More and more patients are going to the internet for medical advice. To keep my practice going, I've changed my name to Dr. Google. And some of you probably have relatives, friends, or even maybe you yourself have a degree in internet medicine. I know I have to keep reminding Bruno that he's the MOA and that he's not allowed to give advice. So, when it comes to balancing the evidence, there's certain rules that I follow, and you've probably heard these rules, parts of them at least, in many of our presentations, in our groups, in our group visits. 
And it's basically four things. First, beware of vested interests. The second is assess the source credibility. The third is what's the quality of the evidence? And the ones that you and I most commonly talk about are what's the risk, what's the benefit, and what's the cost? And you, you've probably got the picture of me lifting my three fingers and going, what's the risk, what's the benefit, what's the cost? So let's talk about vested interest, because this is a true ad that some of you may or may not know that cigarettes were actually touted as a treatment for asthma by physicians in the early days. And so there's a lot of people out there who are wanting to make money from you. They know that you're the cat hanging there, desperation. And so they take advantage of your vulnerability. One example of this is what I call monetization of early research findings. So there's a study that shows that rats have this, or there's a study that shows that patients have a low this. And all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of people making money by supplementing that. Even though we don't know whether it being low is an effect or a cause, even though we don't know whether replacing it makes a difference, and if it does, how long, how much, at what risk and at what cost. I have one patient who learned the hard way. She spent over a quarter of a million dollars traveling around the world looking for answers. And you guys know my metaphor about the cake, the icing on the cake and the sprinkles. The, ice, the cake itself, the most important thing for you is pacing and energy conservation. But the problem is that the sprinkles are colorful, they're exciting. And so people want to try oxazo acetate, or they want to try green laser therapy, or transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation, or hyperbaric oxygen. And those things are not the cake. So until you have the pacing and the energy conservation well developed, and your symptoms are stable, that's when you put on the icing and you put on the sprinkles. So today, we're going to be focusing on the icing and the sprinkles. Some sprinkles are going to be super expensive. Some sprinkles are going to be free. So this was a question that a patient posed to me. She was considering going to the U.S. for stem cell therapy for chronic fatigue syndrome. And I had never heard of that. And so I do what I usually do is I go to what we call Medline or Ovid and I can search the medical database. So here you can see I did a search initially for chronic fatigue syndrome and we identified almost 5,100 articles and then stem cell transplantation, 21, over 21,000 articles and then the overlap of one and two. Zero. So here's a company offering a treatment that costs over $50,000 that does not even have a rat study, nothing. And so you might say, well, how are we supposed to do this if we don't have access to Ovid or to Medline? Well, a lot of you hear me talk about Google Scholar. And Google Scholar is a great place for you to access peer-reviewed literature. So if you want to know, is there a study and what is it? It doesn't have all the fine tools for, for, for looking at the searches and organizing them, but it can give you some really good information. So here's the same search, stem cell transplantation and chronic fatigue syndrome. So I scrolled through and there's nothing again, but what's even ironic is that the first study over here, it's experience of severe fatigue in stem cell transplantation. And so the first study that we see talks about harm as opposed to benefit. But there's still somebody out there who's willing to do it. Sometimes you don't even need to go 
to Google Scholar. This was one that was in uh, a magazine. It was talking about blood washing is the latest dubious and pricey long COVID trend. So you can have your blood washed, which you can imagine the risks of infection and clotting at a cost of over $60,000. And with our Canadian dollar, that means over $81,000. So beware of vested interest. There's somebody who's wanting to monetize research that's not ready for prime time. And they're taking advantage of the desperation action model. The second thing is source credibility. How believable. There's an old joke that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And so on the internet, you have no idea who's posting what, why, and for what reason. And if there is a cure for chronic fatigue syndrome, it's going to be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. It's not going to be hidden inside a blog that nobody reads. Having said that, that doesn't mean that there aren't any blogs that are worth looking at. So for instance, here's one of my favorites. I put this in your consult notes now. I suggest that you do some research on Health Rising. And so it's healthrising.org. And what I suggest is that you subscribe, it's free. And about once a week, maybe twice a week, you get a review from Court Johnson, who's a science journalist, who reviews the literature and summarizes it. I can say that 99% of the time I agree with his interpretation, but even more importantly, he makes a distinction between his opinion and the evidence. Because often you'll see scientists argue with each other and they'll say, well, read this paper. And the other one says, read this paper. And it's the same paper. They've just got a different take on it. So it's not just the evidence itself. It's the interpretation of the evidence. So the, the nice thing that Court does is that he puts a link to the original article that he's talking about. If you happen to have a few extra pennies, you can also... You can also send him a little bit of money to help support the website. Another one that I subscribe to that I really like is the Long COVID Weekly Newsletter. And you can see there's 58 weeks here. It's a review of not just the science, but of the politics and where things are going. Again, I think that this website is very balanced. And also, they make explicit opinion from the data. So in this case, they start with the data, and then he ends up with what he calls my take on this. So my take on this is... Da -da 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 -da. And so that does a great job separating opinion from evidence. And so if you're interested on my website, if you go under resources, under helpful websites, you'll see here's Google Scholar, here's Health Rising, here's the Long COVID Weekly Newsletter, CCDP, blah, blah, blah. And if you look at these, I would say that you could get 99% of all the information that you need from these websites right here. No need to go down a rabbit hole of the internet that all the good information is right here. And I've included one other, which I often refer to in group medical visit, which is drugsearch.ca. And this is for information on which drugs are covered by which plans and the cost. So for instance, you might've read about guanfacine and you say, I wonder if guanfacine is covered. And so over here, you can see the cost for guanfacine tablets and the cost for the one milligram is not that different than the four milligrams. 
And over here are the different plans. So whether it's First Nation plans or low income plan, that it'll tell you if this is covered by plan C or plan G or whichever program, or as in this case, not covered at all. So we're gonna come back to Guan Facine a little bit later in how we make decisions, but this is one of my favorite websites and I can tell you that I refer to it all the time. So beware the vested interest, people trying to make money off of you. How credible is the source? Is it just an opinion? Because one of the things that I find interesting is patients often send me information and I love it. But sometimes what they send me is a blog of somebody's opinion, which to me has zero value. Or a YouTube presentation that doesn't present any research results. And so to me, those sources of information are really you know, useless. And so we're looking at source credibility and then quality of the evidence. So this is how I explain things to my young medical students. I talk about the funnel of knowledge and it's really wide at the top. And there's lots and lots of studies. So sometimes the test tube studies and the animal studies, they take decades if ever they come to fruition, ready for prime time. And if you look at news articles, what they often do on the news is they pick articles over here that have zero clinical re relevance because it may be another 10, 20, 30 years or never before this ever makes it into clinical practice. And so most information follows a certain pattern. There might be some preclinical or animal studies. There might be some anecdotal uh, reports about individuals or experience. There might be early clinical studies where first you look at old charts and you do what's called a retrospective. So you say, oh, let's take all the charts of patients and see how many of them did this. And then something slightly better where you observe them prospectively and then case control. And then you get into the clinical trials. We have phase one, phase two, phase three, and the phase three randomized clinical trial is considered the gold standard for evidence. So this is randomized, double-blind, controlled trial. But even then, that might not be ready for prime time. Maybe these guys, these gals, their study doesn't agree with other studies. And so it needs to be replicated. And then you need a bunch of studies and then the studies need to be consistent. And then you have a meta-analysis. And then finally, in one of the major journals, somebody will write an editorial about this and it will be ready for prime time. And so it's not surprising that there's so much information out there because even just reading this is a big job. And I used to teach a course a long time ago for young doctors and sometimes not so young doctors on how to keep up with the literature. And one of the first things that you need to do is you need to figure out where you're going to read. Because trying to read randomly among this is not going to be helpful. First, you have to realize that this exists. And second, you have to figure out how to find it. There's, you know, if you tried to read the entire funnel, just what was published this month, and you're a young doctor, and you would work at it full time, by the time that you retired, you still wouldn't have read everything. And so it's impossible to keep up with the literature completely widely so you have to be very strategic in how you do it. And so most of the people who teach how to do this talk about focusing on the stuff that's near the end of the funnel and the stuff that has made it into prime time. So it's not surprising when, hey, you read this article. 
and then you ask me or you ask another doctor if they've read it, chances are almost zero. Because unless you have a special interest and you keep an eye out for stuff up the funnel, most of this stuff never makes it into practice and isn't even ready for prime time. So we talked earlier about if you're a cardiologist, you have lots of these editorials, meta-analyses, randomized control trials, 10,000 people, 20,000 people that help you make decisions. But for us, we're often looking at phase one or retrospective or observational or anecdotal. So how do we use that evidence and how do we decide? So some of you might remember a while back a medication called rituximab. And I call this a cautionary tale because there was so much excitement about rituximab for a while. And for those of you who don't remember, rituximab is a biological agent. And every, anytime you see the word MAB, A-B, that's antibody. And so these are biologic agents. These are antibodies that do specific jobs. Some of you may be on some of these for migraines or for connective tissue disease, but rituximab specifically downregulates the beta cells, the immune cells. And so the idea was that there's a component of ME that is autoimmune, and that if we dampen the autoimmune or the immune system, that we're going to find a benefit. And so here's a phase one trial. And look at this, it's double blind and placebo controlled. They had 28 patients, 64% of whom improved. So this was exciting. Come back three years later, a, ran, a phase three randomized double blind controlled trial that was powered enough to show a difference. Because if you flip a coin 10 times, you might get 10 heads. And if you flip a coin 28 times, you might get 18 heads. But is that by chance? And that's why when you read about studies being powered, what they mean is that there's enough people in the study to show a difference that is likely not due to chance. And so some of you are familiar with the p-value and the p-value tells you what the likelihood of this study being the results, the difference being due to chance. And so a p-value of 0 0.05, meaning 5% chance of it being just dumb luck, is the cutoff point that's accepted. But you'll see some studies with p-values of 0 0.00001, which tells you that this is one in 100, one in 1,000, one in 10,000. And the better the p-value, the more likely that the result is due to a real difference as opposed to random luck. And so over here, you can imagine how much disappointment there was when there was no difference between the placebo group and the rituximab group. That didn't stop tons of patients asking me for it. And here, rituximab is an injectable. It costs several thousand dollars a year. And so that's a problem. Be aware of vested interests. Somebody wants to make money off of you. How credible is the source? What's the quality of the evidence? How far down the pipeline? And then we do what we normally do in our clinical visits is we weigh risk, benefit, and cost. And so those are my three questions I always ask when I help you make a decision. What's the cost? What's the risk? And what's the benefit? And so the higher the cost, the higher the risk, the higher the quality of evidence that's needed. And so something that's super expensive or super risky, we would need large randomized control trials before it ever made it into 
prime time. So let's come back to our shared decision making and let's evaluate different medications based on those three questions. Many of you have heard me call low dose naltrexone the medication for people who don't like medication. And there's three reasons for that. The first is that it's a very low dose. It's one one hundredth to one tenth of a tablet. Some people can even start at one five hundredth. At those doses, there's minimal side effects. And people like the mechanism of action. It improves the health of the brain. So I talk about putting the glee back in the glial cells. The glial cells are active, are activated. They produce neuroinflammatory cytokines. And those cytokines are believed to be at the root of many of your symptoms. And so what we want to do is we want to put the glee back in the glial cells. And so some of you may not be aware, but there is not even a single study of low-dose naltrexone in ME, not a single one. The studies have been done with fibromyalgia, and they're small, randomized controlled trials. And overall, it seems consistent that about a 20% reduction in cytokines correlates with about a 20% improvement in symptoms. Well, you might say, well, how did we make the leap for chronic fatigue syndrome? Well, if you think about the fact that 70 plus percent of patients have both chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, and that pain and fatigue are seen in both conditions, and that there are other studies of chronic pain that use low-dose naltrexone, that it's a reasonable assumption that it would make a difference. How reasonable? That depends on you. How reasonable? That depends on the cost and the risk. If it were expensive or if it were risky, we would need, I mean, this would be thrown out. It wouldn't even be looked at. So right now, there's a, a study that we're hoping to have the result. It's a large randomized controlled trial. I'm crossing my finger that it doesn't turn out to be another rituximab, but we should have the results sometimes in 2023. There's a long COVID study, but there still isn't even a study for chronic fatigue syndrome that I know of. So up until about two or three years ago, I can't time fast so quickly. The problem with naltrexone was the cost because you had to have it compounded. And so for a lot of patients, cost is the one that depends the most on patient values and patient preferences. How are you going to spend $1,000? Is $1,000 worth it for you? If you're Madonna, $1,000 is even less than pocket change. But if you're living on PWD, $100 a month is a huge amount of money. And so there are a lot. And unfortunately, you know, three quarters of my patients are not working. And the vast majority of those are on some form of disability. Then a paper was, was published. And it was not a clinical paper. It was a pharmacological paper. And somebody looked at does naltrexone stay effective? Does, it, does the chemical naltrexone remain effective when it's put in liquid? And the study showed that for, and I can't remember if it's two thirds or three quarters of a year, long enough that it was stable. And that means we had a new option. We would take one tablet, 50 milligrams, put it in 50 milliliters of liquid, which would give us one milligram per milliliter. We would give the patients a five milligram syringe and they would work their way up from 0.5 to one, to 1.5 to two, to 2.5 to three, to 3.5 to four, to 4.5, which was a steady dose. Even if it were not covered, which it is, three tablets is not very expensive. It's about $30. But for the vast majority of people, this is covered. And so now we can say that 
if it were me, I look at the cost, I look at the risk, and I look at the benefit. The risk is virtually zero. This medication has been around for such a long time. The cost is no longer a factor. And so now it becomes a question of, are you comfortable with the level of research given the risk and the cost? And in my mind, yes, but that might not be in your mind. But this is one that I feel comfortable offering to patients. And then some of you have heard of or have tried low-dose aripiprazole, low-dose Abilify. And low-dose aripiprazole, Abilify, in high doses blocks dopamine. In low doses, it actually stimulates it. And what do we call a low dose? Anywhere below two milligrams. And what do we call a high dose? Anything above 15 milligrams. And in this case, there were 25% of patients out of 101 who were non-responders and 75% who were responders. Just looking at the study, retrospective, lower quality evidence, 101 patients, no control. What's the mechanism of action? Does it make sense? Yes, it, it combats neuroinflammation, and that's thought to be especially at the brainstem. And we talk a lot about the brainstem in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. And also Abilify is an important bridge between the nervous system and the immune system. So if we look at the results of the study, they're quite impressive, almost too impressive. If we look at the fatigue scores, so the fatigue scores almost halved. The brain fog more than halved and the sleep not quite halved. And 20% of patients reported a complete disappearance of post-exertional malaise. Hmm. Cost, it's covered. Risk, we've been using this medication for a long time, and we also use it at low doses for something called, uh, for, for when patients are on a antidepressant and it needs a little bit of a kick in the pants to get working. And so we have lots of experience with low doses as well. And these doses are even smaller than that. And so given the cost, given the low risk, is this enough evidence of benefit for you to decide to take it? Here's another one that I get lots of questions and I get lots of questions in the group medical visits. So some of you know about oxaloacetate. And it's a supplement. It generates NAD plus, which plays a role in the metabolism of sugars, proteins, and fatty acids. And it's involved in making energy, the ATP, the Krebs cycle. So it's involved in the mitochondria. And patients have low oxaloacetate. Interesting. So you say, well, maybe we should try replacing that. There's no studies of replacement, but it's a supplement. So it's available over the counter. How risky can it be? Dr. David Kaufman reported an in-house study. So if we look at here, this is not published, not peer reviewed. And he looked at 52 patients for six weeks and he gave some of them 500 milligrams twice a day and some of them 1,000 milligrams twice a day. And then he used a fatigue scale. On average, the people who took 500 milligrams had a 25% reduction in fatigue. Patients who took 1,000 milligrams had a further 35% reduction. That means a 60% reduction in fatigue. But if you look at different fatigue scores, the results were not completely consistent. But overall, 80% of patients reported some improvement by as much as 80%. Interesting. So 
cost and risk. Well, the risk is low. And so in the future, Dr. Kaufman is hoping to get funding to do a randomized placebo controlled trials, but often the large randomized controlled, uh, large randomized placebo controlled trials don't happen because somebody's got to make a lot of money from something to spend the hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this study. Luckily, with the amount of money that's being poured into long COVID, there actually is a long COVID oxaloacetate study underway. So what's the problem? Cost. At 500 milligrams a day, estimate, depending on where you bought it, was around five to $600 a month, which means that 1,000 milligrams a day would cost you over 1,000 bucks. To me, the cost is way too much. And the benefit, theoretical, and so the higher the cost, the higher the risk, the more robust the evidence, and this evidence is definitely not robust. So we finally get a trial, but this is a non-randomized controlled trial. In this one, they looked at historical controls from meta-analysis studies. So they didn't compare them, they didn't randomize them, you get this and you don't know what it is, they just look at what usually happens to patients. And they looked at a relatively small number of patients. So in the chronic fatigue group, 23 patients got 500 milligrams twice a day. 29 patients got 1,000 milligrams twice a day. And 24 patients got 1,000 milligrams three times a day. And I know what you guys are already thinking. 1,000 milligrams cost over 1,000 bucks. So are we talking about like 3,000 bucks a month? There's also 22 long COVID patients who took 500 milligrams. But it looks like there's a signal there. Improvement of fatigue was seen to be dose dependent. And dose de dependence is often uh, a sign that something really works. I give you a little bit, you get a little bit of benefit. I give you more, you get more benefit. I give you even more, you get even more benefit. And long COVID patients' fatigue was significantly reduced by up to 46% in six weeks. But now the cost is even more crazy than before. So this is not one that I recommend. However, I do have some patients who are financially uh, at the point where 3000 bucks is pocket change, and they try it, and they tell me that it works. I don't have enough patients who have that kind of money for me to see a pattern of benefit or no benefit. But just to say that for this one, it really comes down to patient preference. Even if it was going to cost you a thousand bucks, is that thousand bucks over several months, is that better spent taking a vacation and relaxing or hiring somebody to do your housework? Because there's always a trade-off when it comes to cost. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So if I did a medical legal report on you, I would put this in your note. I don't put it in my patient's notes for MSP because this is expensive. And, but if somebody else is gonna pay for you and the insurer ICBC has a responsibility to try and get you back to where you were, then I usually recommend this. And so this is, there's a study right now uh, going on at UCLA on chronic fatigue syndrome. It's the first chronic fatigue syndrome PMS study. It's already considered painless and safe. It's already used in fibromyalgia and mood disorders. There's good studies. There are some prior small studies, a case series and a small open label trial, which show some benefit. But what's interesting about this study is that instead of focusing on one part of the brain, they're focusing two parts of the brain. The one that's really interesting is the amygdala, the screaming omen of terror. And so the idea is to try and calm the fight or flight in addition to the other areas that are usually used for pain. 
hopefully we'll see the results in the near future. But right now, it's a question of cost. I do have a number of patients who've tried it. Some of them report benefits, some of them don't. Here's one that I commonly recommend. And this is the Gupta program for amygdala retraining. And so here in the abstract, you can see that MAIR demonstrated significantly greater reduction in functional impairment, anxiety, and depression, as well as a higher improvement in mindfulness, self-compassion, a post-treatment follow-up with a moderate to large effect. Interesting. Because this is the first study that's a randomized controlled trial of neuroplasticity. And what was the control group? The control group was relaxation therapy. And we already know that relaxation therapy is helpful. And so this was looking at how much better than relaxation therapy is this. So it was eight weeks, two hour sessions, and then three monthly sessions. The amount of work was only 15 to 20 minutes, which to me was really interesting because the DNRS program usually wants you to commit at least an hour a day. And when I was doing a neuroplasticity program, I was asking people to commit an hour a day on neuroplasticity and an hour a day on other things to improve their self-care. And so if we look at the results here, this is the this is the fibromyalgia score. And here they're talking about who had a 20% improvement in their score and who had a 50% improvement. Well, 84% of patients who did the Gupta program had a more than 20% improvement compared to only less than 20% in the relaxation group. A more than 50% improvement in the score, over a third of patients who did the Gupta program, and none of the patients who did the relaxation. A lot of studies nowadays include some other aspect of the study that looks for biological plausibility of the effect. And so in this case, they also found a significant reduction in brain-derived neurotropic factor in patients in the MAIR group. What does that mean? Nobody knows. But it does show that the difference is not just a difference that is subjective. There's also some objective measures to show that the treatment does cause a difference. And so again here, the, th the problem is cost. Luckily, compared to other neuroplasticity programs, which can run from you know, 500 to 1,000 to several thousand dollars, this one here is just over a hundred bucks US. And if you, if you want to, you can try it for free for a month. And so from my perspective, it seems to be a no brainer, but easy for me to say, because I don't have to pay a hundred dollars. This is the one that I usually recommend that people start with. And if you go to my website and you go to the section on neuroplasticity, the Gupta group has just published another randomized control trial, this time on long COVID. And again, they've shown a benefit. So this was exciting to me because it's some of the first strong evidence that we see a benefit with the use of neuroplasticity. I have a number of patients, not so many lately, who want to use hydrocortisone or prednisone or one of the other steroids to reduce, quote, inflammation. And so this study has 2,428 participants, 601 of whom had fibromyalgia, and 25 of whom had chronic fatigue syndrome. It was a 24-week open-label study. And the average improvement was 76%. Wow. However, 
one of the reasons that you want to look at the editorials and the opinions is that this was a hugely flawed study. It was complicated by a whole bunch of different regimens of, of hydrocortisone. And also some people got antibiotics. They didn't explain that. And so, but what's more important is that the results were not consistent with other data because we have other data to show that it doesn't make a difference. So it's also a short-term trial. It was, there was no placebo. It was not controlled. It wasn't blinded. And the doses that they use were high enough to cause adrenal suppression. That means harm. But they never measured if adrenal suppression happened. And that's why when I see patients get put on steroids by their naturopath, it really, um, it really worries me. And I often, I don't often give strong opinions, but I give my opinion whenever I see patients on the steroid, not that I'm trying to force the patient, but I want them to realize that I think that this is actually dangerous. And so over here, the risk is huge and the benefit is not proven. So this is definitely not ready for prime time. Some of you may remember if you if you follow the Health Rising website, a drug called CT38. There was a few articles about it. And, the thing that was interesting about this is almost every drug that we've talked about, in fact, every drug that we've talked about is a drug that's used for something else that's being tried in chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. In this case, this was a novel drug. It was a completely new drug. It wasn't repurposed from something else. And what was interesting is that the drug targets the stress response and inflammation. And so the hypothesis was that chronic fatigue syndrome leads to alterations in the stress response, stress receptors in the limbic system. And that's what we talk about when we say that the stress response is stuck in the on position. And when they first started talking about this drug, and remember, they were also looking for funding to do the trials, is they thought that it would reset the limbic system which meant you didn't have to use it for a long time and that it could possibly lead to a cure. And so what they were looking at was resetting the hypothalamic pituitary axis so it doesn't stay stuck in the odd position. Interesting. So here's the first study a couple of years ago, and now the drug has a name. It's called Cortine. And to remind us, Remember that the HPA axis starts with the screaming almond of terror that Zara calls it, the amygdala, but the amygdala puts out CRF, corticotropin releasing factor, corticotropin releasing hormone. And so, you've, so many of you have seen this picture lots of times. I use it in many of my presentations. And so basically we know that the hypothalamus releases CRF which then stimulates the pituitary gland to get the stress response going. And so there are two versions of the receptor, CRF receptor one and CRF receptor two. And each of these represent the on or the off switch. And so what happens is that the C CRF receptor two is in the on position. And so normally what would happen is you would be in the off position, you would have a stress response, and then it would quickly go back to the off position. But what's believed to happen, and this fits in with the current hypotheses about how chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia work, is that one episode of high stress like PTSD or infection or prolonged stress leads to hypersensitivity of the system. And I talk about high baseline sensitivity, reactivity, and slower baseline. And the system that's stuck in the odd position. 
So cortein only reacts with the CRF R2 receptor. You might say, well, why the hell would you want to activate the on receptor when it's already on? Well, the theory is that if you overload it, it'll reset, almost like rebooting your computer. And so you give a big dose, you reset the receptor, it goes back to the off position, and theoretically, it starts to work properly. And so you get back to homeostasis, and instead of having CRF R2 receptors predominant in your hypothalamus, you have the CRF receptor 1. So here's the study. Cortine, cortine 14 person open label trial for safety, tolerability, and efficacy. So this is a phase one trial. And basically, to be crude, you give it to 14 people and you see if any of them die. I'm being facetious, but you're looking for really bad side effects. So you're looking for, is it safe? Did they tolerate it? And if you're lucky, maybe you'll show some benefit. The problem is that the treatment takes three and a half hours of intravenous infusion, three times at a huge cost, not just the cost of the medication, but the cost of going into a day treatment program and getting the infusions. The results, a little bit promising, but not anywhere near the cure that was being touted when the drug first appeared. It was a 25% improvement. And so the authors say that the trial supports the hypothesis that CRF receptor 2 is upregulated in chronic fatigue syndrome. So hugely expensive, huge risk in terms of getting IV treatment and benefit not proven. So definitely not ready for prime time. Let's look at a couple more, or maybe one more. And this is one that I've sent you the article because my recommendation, and here is how I'm supporting it. So you as a patient will decide whether or not you think the evidence is strong enough, is using Paxlovid. That's, that's been shown to be helpful in preventing long COVID or metformin. And I suggest both. And so here, outpatient treatment of COVID with metformin, ivermectin, fluvoxamine, and the development of long COVID over a 10-month follow-up. And if we assume that long COVID is a post-viral syndrome, that patients with long COVID as a baseline or chronic fatigue syndrome as a baseline are at high risk of a devastating reduction in function if they get infected again. You'll see the first big thing over here. This article is a preprint and has not been peer reviewed. Yikes. So we're really jumping on the bag bandwagon early with this one. So let's go forward and see why I'm such a bandwagon for this one and a poo-poo naysayer for others. Well, this trial had over a thousand people in it. Most of the trials that I read about do not have this number. More is that this was multi-site. And when something is multi-site, you can see if different sites are getting the same response. And so it adds to the strength of the evidence. Phase three, randomized, quadruple blinded, placebo controlled clinical trial. So we can assume that this is a gold standard trial. After it gets peer reviewed, assuming that there's no major flaw in it, that we're hoping that the results will be representing a true benefit. Overall, there was a 42% relative decrease in the incidence of long COVID in the metformin group. By the way, ivermectin, because I keep getting asked for ivermectin, no benefit. And so, what does a 42% reduction mean? Well, that's a relative reduction. And so here we know that about 10% of people who get COVID get long COVID, and this reduced it by 40% to 
And so what's the risk of taking metformin for two weeks? Very low. We have hundreds of thousands of people who, before the advent of Ozempic, used metformin as a weight loss drug. So they didn't have diabetes. And it's relatively well tolerated. Some people have to stop for diarrhea. And so relatively low risk, especially when you're only using it for two weeks. The cost, it's covered. And even if it's not covered, it's super cheap. And so now the question becomes, uh, do you think that it's worth trying this with the possibility that it doesn't work? Or do you want to risk not taking it and it does work? And this is where the interaction between patient preference and values comes into the decision making. And that's why because of where the evidence is at. That's why I sent out this paper. You have a, a link to this paper that Bruno sent you so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not you want to use metformin if you get COVID. I can tell you that we are traveling and I'm taking metformin and Paxlovid with me along with some COVID tests so that in case I get COVID while I'm traveling, that I'm able to treat myself with both drugs. Guanfacine. So there's an interesting study about the use of guanfacine and NAC, N-acetylcysteine. That's a supplement that many of you are already using. It's one of the ones that Dr. Morello puts on his hit list in the treatment of brain fog in patients with long COVID. 12 patients with brain fog, guanfacine, one to two milligrams with NAC supplement, 600 milligrams, two thirds improved, one third stopped it. Half of those stopped it because they felt dizzy. And it is known to cause a bit of drop in blood pressure but that can be easily mitigated with a little bit of salt. And so guanfacine, I like for a number of reasons. One of them is that it's used for ADHD and there's lots of overlap with ADHD in my patient population. The second is that it's a non-stimulant ADHD medication. So some patients like modafinil or Vyvanse or some of the other medications, but what happens is that it triggers their dysautonomia or it makes their anxiety worse. And so it's not one that's overly well tolerated. It can also give them a false sense of energy that they act on. And so they end up crashing more. Whereas guanfacine is a non-stimulant. Even better, it's known to calm the amygdala, that screaming almond of terror. And so one of the ways that it works is that it reduces the fight or flight response, which is what we're looking to do. And so far, the vast majority of my patients who have decided to stay on it have noticed an improvement in their fight or flight response. Some patients have even reported a significant improvement in their heart rate variability, which means their parasympathetic is doing better because their sympathetic is downregulated. So what's the problem here? And I showed that in the drug search earlier, is that it's not covered by Pharmacare. And it costs $105 to $165 per month. That's quite a bit of money. And so it's not for everybody. But if you happen to be lucky enough to have third-party drug coverage, it may be worth a try. But then again, this is where the overlap between the evidence, my expertise, and your preferences and values helps you make a decision. Micronized PEA. This one's a no-brainer for me. There's over 253 articles on micronized PEA. And this is a recent 2023 meta-analysis of 11 of the most high-quality randomized controlled trials. Overall, this included 774 patients, and 
the authors say the results of this systematic review and meta-analysis suggest that PEA is an effective and well-tolerated treatment for chronic pain. On top of that, there's some studies to suggest that it helps with brain fog, some studies to suggest that it helps with a leaky gut, and with mast cell activation. And so with this one, the problem again is cost. The problem is not nearly as, a, as bad as it was five years ago. Five years ago, I had almost no patients use this because you had to import it from the Netherlands. And the cost was around $200 a month. And so I really wasn't recommending it unless patients asked me about it. At a cost of $30 to $60 per month, it's up to you whether or not you think that the benefit, which has really strong evidence, the best evidence that we ever get in these conditions at virtually no risk, then it becomes a question of, is the cost worth it? DAO. So this is one that we've talked about in our MCAS presentation, mast cell activation syndrome. And DAO is diamine oxidase, which is a supplement or an enzyme that used to be called histaminase. And anytime you see A's, it means a degrading enzyme. So this degrades the histamine in the food that you eat. Open label, pilot study, small number of people, four weeks, 0.3 milligrams up to three times a day, and all symptoms improved significantly during the oral supplementation. But here again, Benefit here, not as robust in terms of quality of the evidence, but the risk is virtually zero. And so it becomes a question of cost. And with this, when you try it, try it for a month, two weeks. And after that, even if it does make a difference, you ask yourself, is this the size of the difference? Is the amount of benefit worth the cost? Okay, so to summarize, we're looking at balancing the evidence, looking at the rules, beware vested interests, how credible is the source, what's the quality of the evidence, and weighing the risk, benefit, and cost. Now I want to talk about, quickly, just for five minutes, and we'll leave 20 minutes for Q&A, it is group medication visit, not group medical visit. Many of you have participated in a group medical visit where we bring 10 people for an hour and we do a round robin of questions. You learn from your questions, you learn from other people's questions. The literature is pretty consistent that the quality of care with group visits is actually very high. So what we're because we're getting to the point where we have a lot of patients that we need to service is it's taking forever to get to see me or Dr. McKay. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do one hour session on a specific medication. The first three we're doing are low-dose naltrexone, low-dose aripiprazole, and guanfacine. And so the first, so the first one's going to be low-dose naltrexone. We're going to ask who's interested in possibly trying low-dose naltrexone. Participating in the session is not a commitment to taking the medication. What are we gonna do? Well, I'm gonna do a presentation about the medication, which means I can talk about it a lot longer than I would in a five or 10 minute visit. We'll talk about the side effects in detail. We'll talk about drug interactions and contraindications in detail. We'll have a Q&A session where you'll learn from not only your questions, but other people's questions. And then you can make a decision to take it or not to take it. And I will send a prescription to your pharmacy. And so we're going to try this out, see how it goes in the new year. We're going to look to see maybe do more. We might do some on sleep, some on MCAS, some on POTS. Do all, also do one called, I've got lots of choices. Help, what should I try? because most of you have seen this or a portion of this in your consult note. And so usually it says medication, no changes. We're gonna try PEA first and I put the information about PEA. And then I put a list of medication options for you. And I put that you can do research on health rising. 
And so these tell you what they help with. Guanfacine, mental clarity, and MCAS, gabapentin, pain, sleep, restless leg, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you're trying to make a decision, you're looking for what we call two furs or three furs, two for ones or three for ones. So if you have migraines, then topiramate is probably a better choice for you because it not only helps with uh, pain, sleep, and restless leg, it also helps with migraines. And so and that's why I'll often ask you, what symptom are you trying to target? Are you trying to target just pain or pain and sleep? And so we'll look at this together as a group. One of the sessions will be on the pros and cons of different medications. And you guys know that if you go to my website under resources and you click medication handouts, there's medication handouts for most of the medications that we prescribe. Here's my dog, Dixie. Why? Just because she's cute. So let's take questions. We have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, okay. So many trials also only use general population, or hardly any for Ehlers Danlos people. I agree. That and that's why we call them orphan diseases, because unfortunately, medicine is organized in a way that it's run by people who can make the most money. And that's why the cardiology trials, they have so many people in them, they have like tens of thousands of people that they can show that this drug is one half percent better than this drug. They don't say one half percent. Let's say your risk goes from 1% to 0.5%. That's a 50% improvement. And that's what they'll market. But their trials are so large and so well-powered that they're able to show minuscule differences. But if you have an orphan disease, like ME, FM, MCAS, POTS, EDS, et cetera, et cetera. It's like we're SOL. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, Beamer, Matt. I have not heard of that. Uh, I don't quite understand your comment about hyperbaric oxygen. Do you think it's useful? Yeah, it's definitely useful. And but it's super expensive. It can cost as much as twenty thousand or forty thousand dollars, depending on how long you use it. And that's why you know the ones that get used the most are for the star athletes who make millions of dollars. Because for them, forty thousand dollars to to help improve healing their knee is nothing. Uh, somebody is a stem cell researcher and had a chuckle. Uh, says, unfortunately, there are a number, a large number of treatment providers for unproven and potentially dangerous stem cell therapies. Yes. If anyone is interested, there's actually an international society for stem cell research has a guide for helping patients navigate these tricky waters. And so it's, uh, so just do a Google search for international society for stem cell research. But the bottom line for that is somebody's asking about medlineplus.gov. Yeah, that's another that's another database. Um, and interestingly, Google Scholar just connects to medlineplus.gov anyway. So uh, that's a, that's another good website. What's the difference between Ovid Medline and PubMed? So the difference between Ovid Medline and PubMed is just who the provider is. They have some small differences in the journals that they include, uh, but it often, more, more often than not, it depends on who's paying for it. So for instance, I'm a UBC faculty, and so UBC pays for Ovid Medline, and that's what I use. But if you're not a UBC faculty and you're part of the College of Physicians, the Co College of Physicians pays for PubMed. And so they're just variations. Uh, let's see here. LDN site shows a small study in Israel. 
yeah, I can't, I can't pretend to be up to date in all of the, the studies. Um, many of them don't come under my radar and that's why a lot of stuff actually gets sent to me by patients like the you know, the updated gupta trial that didn't get uh didn't get picked up by court johnson at health rising and it didn't get picked up in you know i have a database search function on my phone and it tells me articles uh and it didn't get picked up by that either and that's why i have my research assistants which are all my patients who often send me really interesting stuff to look at. Uh, oh, I can't think of the uh, offhand of the liquid shelf life of low dose naltrexone, but I will pull that up whenever we do the presentation on low dose naltrexone in the group medication visit. What is the very lowest dose of naltrexone you can take? Well, theoretically, you can take as low as you want. You just dilute it more. But if you take the 50 milligram tablet and put it in 50 milligrams of liquid, I usually ask the pharmacist not only to give you a five milligram syringe, but a one milligram syringe, which means that you can get to 0.1 milligram, which means you can get to one five hundredth of a, a tablet. But theoretically, you could put that tablet in... 100 milliliters so that it's 0.5 uh, milligrams per milliliter and then take one one thousandth and so it's it's up to how much you want to dilute it so you can take as low as you want uh can we test our dopamine and serotonin serotonin levels no because it would be it would be useless because it doesn't it doesn't matter the level because there's all different places so there's you know 50% of your dopamine is made in your gut and it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier and 90% of the serotonin is made in your gut and so what you would measure has tells you nothing about where it's acting where it's being produced and which receptors is it tickling and so it would be it would be really uh it would really be more confusing information than anything uh, thoughts on research for symptoms for suspected possible diagnosis. Are you Googling overlapping symptoms to find out what they might be related to a certain before speaking to our doctor? It all depends on, on your doctor. For some reason, many doctors out there are really um, threatened by patients who look stuff up on the internet. And I don't mind having a conversation. Uh, and it all depends on you know, the information that you bring because a lot of patients will bring me stuff. I read something in a, in a chat room. Well, you know, that doesn't carry much weight. Uh, but you know, if your level of sophistication and especially if you, if you print the paper, some doctors will be uh, very thankful, like me. Other doctors will be resentful. And so it's a bit of a, a, a bit murky to navigate. Uh, can we get the OAA in tiny cheap amounts to see if it works? Actually, I looked. Just for this presentation, I looked to how much it cost, and I could. It's not available on Amazon, and I didn't do a very deep search. But the first one that came up was seven was uh, five hundred American dollars for sixty tablets of the thousand milligrams. And so, you're talking eight ish, nine ish, hundred um, Canadian dollars for the smallest. You know, the lower dose is not the lowest, but the lower dose is in the study. Um, are you saying the 50 milligram pill of, is usually covered by insurance? Yes. I've been getting my uncompounded, not covered by extended Blue Cross. And that's why I usually, if you are a patient, my first time I see you, I see you on naltrexone. I ask you if you're having it compounded, if it's covered, and if you want to make it yourself. And for some people, the convenience of having it compounded is worth a hundred bucks, and so that so that's great. And if you uh, if you want to know how to make it, 
there's on my website, the same place I showed the medication handouts, it says, I can't remember if it says uh, recipe or how to make naltrexone, but it's really easy. You take one pill, 50 milligrams, and put it in 50 milliliters of liquid. And in that case, it means if you're talking about milligrams or milliliters, it doesn't matter. If you're on one milliliter, you're on one milligram. If you're on two milligrams. And so you can bring that sheet to your nurse practitioner and ask them to prescribe it. If a patient has PTSD and long COVID, would MSP covered magnetic? No, and I actually looked at that. It's interesting. If you live in now, of course, my, my goldfish mind can't remember. So what I'm telling you is, is probably not going to be true. But there were three provinces, and I think Manitoba was one of them and Quebec was one of them. But there are three provinces where magnetic stimulation is covered. But unfortunately, we are not one of them. Yeah, and so medication may be expensive now, but the price does go down over time. Yes, exactly. And so what we often see is when something becomes genericized, it becomes more, uh, more affordable, but sometimes not super more affordable. So I'll give you an example. Deloxetine is now available as a generic, but it's still pretty expensive. And so for the most part, patients who don't have coverage, I still use venlafaxine. Is guanfacine the only ADHD med that can be used also for long COVID? No, a lot of other ADHD meds have been used. And that's what I was talking about, the stimulants. So I have patients who take Vyvanse. The classic one that patients take for chronic fatigue syndrome is usually uh, modafinil. But a lot of patients who are trying to lose weight take Vyvanse. Vyvanse is a weight loss drug. That's also an ADHD drug. It's also a brain fog drug. Uh, some patients are taking Adderall, methylphenidate, uh, different ones. Do you recommend to take multiple treatments at the same time? So the answer is yes and no. You want to take them one at a time. And because they work by different mechanisms, you can stack them and see how much added benefit you get at what cost. And the cost, not just of money, but the cost of adverse events, side effects, dry mouth, et cetera, et cetera. And so most of my patients are on a few medications, but like I said, I have many patients who much prefer, uh, much prefer a non-pharmacologic approach. Where is PTSD found in the brain? Well, PTSD is found in a lot of different areas of the brain, but one of the main areas is the amygdala, that screaming almond of terror is that it's sensitized, doesn't take much for it to be triggered. Uh, if I get re reinfected, should I take both Paxlovid and Metformin or just one or the other? Well, all depends on how much weight you put on the evidence. For me, I would take both because you're only taking them for a short period of time. And for me, the risk profile is low enough and the cost is cheap. Paxlovid is covered by the government, whether regardless, and metformin is super cheap, even if you don't have coverage. And most, if you have government coverage, it's it's covered. Uh, what about longer term use for metformin for CFS? Yeah, and so sometimes I'll have patients who come to me and they'll say, I read this study and that was one example is metformin long-term for CFS. And again, you know, I sit with the patient, the risk is not high, the cost is not high, the evidence is definitely not great, but hey, what if they wanna try it, I have no problems prescribing it because the risk is so low and the cost is so low. Having said that, Every patient who's tried long-term metformin for chronic fatigue syndrome, they've all come off of it because they have not noticed the benefit. There's a theoretic benefit of metformin, but the studies are really not that robust. Uh, how long of a period after getting COVID would one be susceptible to long COVID? Well, usually long COVID occurs within the first six months of 
having a COVID infection, the vast majority of patients who have long COVID, the story is they got over the initial infection, but they never got back to normal. So more often than not, there isn't even usually a lag for it to show up. Nicotine patches. Yeah, that's one of the ones I'm still waiting for somebody. That's another one that made it that made it through my filter. I, you know, my filters haven't caught that one. And I've had a, a few patients ask me about nicotine patches. So it's on my to-do list to have a look at. Um, that one there, if you look at the risk, a little bit higher, right? Because number one, it the risk of addiction, which is not small, and or that nicotine is a stimulant that can actually make some of your other symptoms worse. And so interesting, I haven't seen the studies myself. Like I said, often patients will see the studies long before I do. If we are taking rosuvastatin to get COVID, do we stop the rosuvastatin when taking Paxlovid? Yes, you do. And when I fill out the form for your Paxlovid and when I put it as a preemptive prescription for your pharmacist, I've reviewed the drug interactions, but also as a double check and a triple check, uh, Bruno has sent you, uh, along with the paper on metformin, a uh, handout on the list of medications that there are interactions with. So you can also double check yourself in case you're on medications that I don't know about. And the triple check is the pharmacist will also check. But yes, rosuvastatin, atorvastatin, you need to stop. Uh, thank you. If I ever need to take metformin and get diarrhea, can we take anti-diarrheal meds? Ugh. Then you're kind of like treating one thing with another thing. I would say, no, just abandon it. Uh, diarrhea is probably the most common symptom or sorry, side effect of metformin, which is why if you look at the two-week trial, we start off with one tablet, then two tablets, then work our way up. Nobody knows that if you don't get to the full dose, if it makes a difference. So if it were me, I would see how much I could tolerate and... But if you're getting significant diarrhea, I wouldn't use an anti-diarrheal. But again, if you wanted to, there's nothing that says you can't. I take metformin for diabetes. Does it still work at COVID? I don't know. And that's what we don't know. Because it will be interesting, and that'll probably come as a retrospective study, that patients who were on metformin were less likely to develop long COVID. Be interesting, but we haven't seen that study yet. But it's definitely uh, one of the things I'm sure somebody will look at look at because it's it's uh, my brain fog is gonna it, it's definitely one of the questions that's easy to answer at least at a crude level of a retrospective chart review. Somebody's interested in joining the group, so if you're interested in joining my groups. Patients who are on the wait list who have not seen me yet can participate in all of the activities except for group medication visit. So if you want to do a group visit, let Bruno know. If you want to join the core group or if you want to join Dr. Uh, Dr. Clark's uh, a holistic approach group, seven weeks, or if you want to join the Elders danlos group, you don't have to have seen me uh, to be able to participate in those groups. Uh, do you know Dr. Jake Teitelbaum? Yes. And no, I don't know his SHINE protocol. And so vitamins and minerals combo, I think it's worth a try. It all depends on how much money somebody's making from you. you know, there's um, there's a, a drug, I, oh, I can't. Um, oh, what was it called? Anyway, it was it's it's available in Canada, but only with a uh, a release from the government when it almost never gets released. And there's a doctor in the U.S. who will give it to you, but it costs a hundred thousand dollars a year. And so, to me, not worth it. So, to me, the vitamin and mineral combo, hey, that sounds like something that's worth a try, as long as it's not too expensive. And I always worry about somebody who tells you they have a secret proprietary mix. Then I think that's all marketing. 
because if they're being transparent, you should be able to um, to do it yourself. The second thing is, I have not seen any evidence that IV uh, any uh, IV vitamins and minerals are better. In fact, to me, they're worse because there's a risk of infection. And so, uh, somebody likes loves Dixie. Yes, I love Dixie too. Uh, can we see the dog again? Sure. <laughs> Let me show you the dog again. Oops, I've turned this off. I'll share the screen again. There's Dixie. And Dixie is only one of three. I have two others, but she's the cutest. Uh, have you heard of nicotine patch? Yes, I have, but I haven't read about it yet. How do I participate in the Gupta program? If you go to the neuroplasticity part of my page, you can get a full article that I showed you here. You can get the article on long COVID. You can watch the DNRS uh, a study from McMaster University. And there's a link to the Gupta program right there. Uh, does metformin help if you already have long COVID? Well, it the idea is that it would prevent you from getting it again. And so to me, long COVID is a post-viral syndrome. We didn't need a new name. And so if what happens is patients who, you know, they say I had chronic fatigue and then I got long COVID. Well, yeah, okay. But you could easily, just as easily say, I have chronic fatigue syndrome. Then I got another virus, which is COVID, which made my chronic fatigue worse. And so the idea here is that let's say you have 30% function from your long COVID or 40% function and you get COVID again and you lose half of that. Well, half of 100% is bad enough, but half of you know, 20 or 30% doesn't leave you with much. And that's why when I write your consult notes, now I talk about protecting yourself because it can be very, it can be devastating to get COVID again if you have long COVID or to get COVID at all if you have chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. Uh, somebody wants to know if they can participate in the group medication visits. No, unfortunately, the group medication visits are the only ones you can't participate in yet because I haven't evaluated you. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I want to thank for those of you who've pushed through and uh, have listened to me talk for such a long time. I will be posting this to our YouTube channel. And so you, are, you will be able to um, have a look at it again in small bites. And if there's parts of it that are particularly interested to you, Bruno will send you the slides and so that you can read the specific slides. Again, Dr. Uh, Danoa sends his regrets and I'm glad that you guys have put up with me uh, at such short notice. Have a great week, everybody.